Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm reception. Thank you, Charlie, for your overly generous introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to you uh, for all you've done to further relations between our two countries. To all of the distinguished guests here, Father Leahy, Robert Morrow of Boston College, to Air Lingus and to Martin Nocton and his family who are sponsoring this event, uh, the Irish ambassador to the U.S., Ann Anderson, and the American ambassador to Ireland, Kevin O'Malley, and Lord Mayor, thank you for your uh, hospitality and inviting us into your home. Uh, I speak often. So for me, to be frank, the introduction is the highlight of the program. <laughs> and I want to say to Charlie that uh, he's getting better every time he introduces me. <laughs> Always nice, of course, to hear good things said about you, particularly in front of a group of strangers. But there is a risk to your mental health. If you hear that stuff often enough, you might begin to believe it. So uh, I always like to begin with a story about introductions and how I was brought back down to earth. I spent uh, five years coming and going to Northern Ireland and chaired three separate sets of negotiations. When I finished, uh, I returned to the United States and wrote a book about that experience. When the book was published, I went on a tour of cities in America promoting sales of the book. I received many, many invitations. In the process, I learned the interesting fact that in the United States, there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> and every one of them invited me to come. I couldn't go to all of them, but I went many, and as I travel the country speaking to these Irish-American groups, they developed among them an informal competition as to who could give the longest, often fantastic, frequently truly ridiculous introductions of them. Uh, in Chicago, a guy got up, he had a printed thing, and he read for 35 minutes every event in my life, many of which I would not been aware of until I heard it. Described it. The proper reaction, of course, would have been to show some humility, to ask them to please keep it short. I had an improper reaction. I loved it. I encouraged them. I scolded them when they left something out. So by the time I got to the last stop on this tour, it was in Stamford, Connecticut, the Irish American Society. There I was overly impressed with myself. I had a hard time squeezing my head through the front door. When I got in, the first person I encountered was an elderly woman, rushed up to me, very excited and nervous, vigorously shook my hand, almost knocked me over, and spent several minutes telling me what a great man I am. And then when she finished, she said, uh, I don't live anywhere near Stanford, she said. I drove all the way across Connecticut, three and a half hours, just to come here, to shake your hand, to tell you how much I think of you, and to ask you, please, would you sign my poster? She handed me a poster with a photograph and a pen. I looked at it, I said, I'd be very happy to sign your poster, but before I do, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> she said, you're not. She said, well, who are you anyway? So when I told her, she was obviously upset. She said, why, that's just terrible. She said, I drove three and a half hours to meet a great man like Kister, and all I've got is a nobody like you. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do to make you feel better. She thought for a moment that she leaned forward, I leaned forward. Our foreheads were nearly touching in a conspiratorial whisper. She said, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> Would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name for my book? <laughs> so I did. And it's a daily reminder to me, hanging in the living room wall in Eastern Connecticut to 
listen carefully to the wonderful words of Charlie Flanagan and others, but don't take it too seriously. <laughs> well, I want to say that it's a true honor for me to be here in connection with this program, sponsored by the U.S. government and administered by Boston College. I congratulate all of you here who have been through the program, and I commend Father Leahy and Boston College and Robert Morrow for their leadership. This program contributes to the resilience, the energy, and the talent of the people and the business community of Ireland. They benefit from the close friendship, business, and personal ties between this country and the United States. Thousands of Irish men and women here in Dublin and all across this island are employed at American-owned businesses. That's a good thing for both of our countries. And fortunately, it's a two-way street. All across America, men and women of Irish citizenship and Irish heritage and others are working and building, creating jobs and communities, deepening our ties, enhancing both societies. There are now well over 200 thousand people working in Irish-owned businesses in America, and that number grows every day. We all should support, nurture, and expand our relationships. Both of our countries have been through some difficult times, still are, and there's a lot to do. But we both can look forward with optimism and confidence to a better future. Many Irish men and women have thanked me for my work in Northern Ireland. But it is I who should be grateful, and I am. My father's parents were born and lived much of their lives in Ireland. Just over a hundred years ago, they sailed to America, seeking a better life, part of the great human tide that traveled from Ireland to the far corners of the earth. History is written by those who succeed, and there were many who did, in America and elsewhere, who deserve our admiration. But there also were many who left one hard life only to find another hard life elsewhere. My father was born in Boston, but he never knew his parents. His mother died. His father couldn't care for their children, and they were raised in orphanages. Eventually, after several years there, my father was adopted by an elderly, childless couple, not Irish, who lived in the state of Maine. At the age of 10, after a few years of elementary school, my father began a long, low-paid life of labor, ending up as a janitor at a local school. He met and married my mother, an immigrant from Lebanon. She could not read or write, and she spent 40 years working the night shift in textile mills while raising five children. My parents led hard lives, lived entirely on the edge of failure and financial disaster. They had one goal in their lives, that their children could get an education and could lead lives in America that were better than theirs. Although they lived and died penniless, in their minds they were successful because each of their children graduated from college and each has lived a life that they could not have imagined. It is because of their efforts and because of the openness of American society that I, their son, was able to get an education and eventually to become the majority leader of the United States Senate. My father knew nothing of his Irish heritage. I never heard him say the word Ireland. So when I retired from the Senate, 
and came to Ireland at President Clinton's request. I had no sense of what it means to be Irish. I've since learned, and for that, I'm deeply grateful. I am an American, deeply proud of my country, and I always will be. But a large part of my heart and of my emotions will forever be here on this beautiful island. When I agreed to President Clinton's request that I serve as his representative in Northern Ireland, I did not fully comprehend the complex history of Ireland, North or South. But I learned and I came to love Northern Ireland, the place and the people. They are warm, they're energetic, they treated me with great, great hospitality. Now, of course, it's true that they are at times combative, and they're quick to take offense, but nobody's perfect. Among the many stories that I love to tell, and I could spend the whole afternoon doing so, about Northern Ireland people is my first meeting as chairman of the Peace Talks. And a wonderful man, great political leader, David Irvine, said to me at the beginning, Senator, if you are to be any use to us, there is one thing you must know. I said, what is it? He said, we in Northern Ireland will drive 100 miles out of our way to receive an insult. <laughs> I never forgot it, but that helped get me through the process. For years thereafter, as President Clinton's representative, then as chairman of the Peace Talks, then for 10 years as the chancellor of Queen's University in Belfast, I traveled to every part of the island. I met and worked with the men and women who were both products of his past and the shapers of its future. In the process, I acquired what I did not have and what my father could not have, a sense of his and my heritage. I often am comforted by the thought that right now and forever, my father is looking down from above and saying, I too was proud to be an American. And I'm thankful that through my son, at long last, I also have learned what it means to be an Irishman. In Northern Ireland, for five years, I worked in difficult and contentious circumstances. The main negotiation lasted for nearly two years. As I've often said, we had 700 days of failure and one day of success. For that, many people deserve credit, none more so than the political leaders of Northern Ireland, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. At a moment of crisis and opportunity, they acted with courage and conviction, and the result has been a largely peaceful society. I know Liz O'Donnell is here. She was in Northern Ireland for the time that I, much of the time that I was there. There may be others. But I want to say to you that in every democratic society in the world, it has become fashionable to criticize and demean political leaders. And let's face it, much of it is deserved. But the reality is that History is made by men and women who at moment of crisis rise to the occasion. And that's what the political leaders of these islands did when the peace agreement was reached. So I'd ask Liz to stand individually and as a representative of the political leaders who made peace possible. Liz, why don't you stand? Nearly two years 
after the negotiations began, we reached agreement. That was, for me, the realization of a dream that had sustained me for several years, the longest, most difficult task of my life. After the agreement was approved, I talked with several of the men and women who had negotiated. We were all overcome with exhaustion and emotion. And as we parted, I told them that I had a new dream. And that dream was to return to Northern Ireland in a few years with my young son, Andrew, who was born during the negotiations. I told them that we will roam the countryside, taking in the sights and smells and sounds of what is one of the most beautiful landscapes in the world. And then, on a rainy afternoon, of which there are many in Northern Ireland, we would drive to Stormont and sit quietly in the visitors' gallery of the Northern Ireland Assembly. There we would watch and listen as the members of the Assembly debated the ordinary issues of life in a peaceful and democratic society. Education, health care, agriculture, tourism, fisheries, trade. There would be no talk of war, for the war would have long been over. There would be no talk of peace, for peace would be taken for granted. On that day, I said, the day on which peace is taken for granted in Northern Ireland, I will be truly and finally fulfilled. I'm pleased to say that 15 years later, I made that trip with my son. We went to the Northern Ireland Assembly and we listened as a minister reported to the members of the Assembly on a conference he had attended in Brussels. It was as dry as dust and as boring as only a government report can be. I was very emotional and fascinated and as he spoke, I recall the words I had spoken 14 years earlier about watching and listening as the members debated the ordinary issues of life in a democratic society, and it finally was happening. I was fully engaged, but after about 20 minutes, my son, who I was so thrilled was there to share this emotional moment with me, turned to me and he said, Dad, this is really boring. <laughs> Can we go now? Can we go now? Isn't that the same question that the people of the United Kingdom answered in the affirmative on June 23rd when they voted to leave the European Union? Although I did not agree with their decision, I respect them as representing the will of the people in a democratic society. It must be, and it will be on. My hope is that the leaders of the United Kingdom and of the European Union will avoid further hostility, further negative talk, and engage responsibly in an effort to find a way the UK to retain its historic ties to Europe. Both the UK and the countries of the continent have benefited from that relationship, as have the United States and Ireland. Other countries, including Switzerland and Norway, have managed to negotiate arrangements that are special to them that they deem beneficial. Although the terms may not be identical, surely responsible leaders can find a way to apply those principles to the UK. Hopefully, one outcome will be no change in the border arrangements between Ireland and Northern Ireland. In both real and symbolic ways, the current status on the border is a benefit to people on both sides. From a broader European perspective. While the EU has many problems, as do all 
human institutions. It has been an important part of what I call the peace project established after the Second World War. In 1870, 1914, and 1939, Europe was devastated by three major land wars. In just the two world wars of the 20th century, an estimated 78 million people were killed in a world in which the population was less than half of what it is today. The EU, the United Nations, NATO, and other institutions were created with the leadership of the United States and the work of Democrats in Europe in part to involve the nations of Europe in political, military, and economic relationships that would make less likely the recurrence of the horrific conflicts of the 20th century. That has been a huge and important achievement, and I hope it will continue. Now, I know there are many Americans here today, and I'd like now to speak directly to them. We're fortunate to be Americans, citizens of a country that, despite its many serious imperfections, is still, in my judgment, the most open, the most free, the most just society in the world. The U.S. is the world's dominant power, and it will continue to be as far into the future as human beings can see. Although we face serious challenges, at home and abroad. Our military strength is by far the greatest in human history, and our economy is by far the world's largest and strongest. But the American people are fearful and anxious. On first impression, it seems contradictory, but it is in fact understandable, and it has occurred many times in the past. For example, in the 1930s, unemployment in the United States reached 24% and millions of Americans struggled just to survive. Then there are some here who will recall the summer of 1968 when our country was torn by dissent over the Vietnam War and by racial disputes. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated. President Johnson withdrew, and riots took place in many major cities. Similar events have occurred in other countries throughout history. The Industrial Revolution was one of the great turning points in all of human history. It began 250 years ago in England. As machines replaced men in the production of goods, the prospect of high levels of unemployment was widespread, as was fear and anxiety. There was unrest, there was violence, there was some exploitation, there was much misery. But there also was a massive increase in productivity that created new goods, new services, new jobs, raising the overall standard of living for the whole society. Over the following century, that revolution spread to most of the Western world, and especially to a then newly free America, where freedom, innovation, new people, and new ideas propelled what had been a small colony to the forefront of nations in the world. Today, we and the rest of the world passing through a revolution in technology that future historians will judge to be as significant as was the Industrial Revolution. Its effects are accelerated and intensified by the dramatic growth since the Second World War of international trade across national borders in goods and services and in the movement of people across national borders in amounts that are without precedent in history. The combined effects have been both positive 
and negative. One has been the creation of wealth without precedent. But that wealth is not being distributed throughout the whole society. And the growth in our economy is uneven across the country. As a result, many parts of the United States are struggling, and many of our fellow citizens are victims, not beneficiaries, of the revolution in technology and trade. And neither we nor any other society has yet devised fully effective policies to offset, to mitigate the adverse effects of increased trade and technology that so many of our fellow Americans are enduring, even as so many others of us benefit. To do that, we need the unity of our people and a unity of purpose, a national commitment to make good health, good education, good jobs available to all Americans. We need to recognize that we are more than just a collection of individuals. We also are citizens of a free society from which we each derive great benefits and to which we owe responsibilities. Most modern nation states began as homogeneous groups in race, language, religion. But the success of America has been the work of people from every part of the world, of different backgrounds, different religions, different languages, all coming together, committed not to a race, not to a religion, but to an ideal which was best expressed by our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, to form a more perfect union. That's the meaning of the simple but powerful statement, E Pluribus Unum, from many, one. We have done so imperfectly, slowly, sometimes having to overcome huge mistakes and tragic misjudgments, but always in the end, overcoming each challenge and emerging better and stronger. Fear and anxiety and harsh responses in times of transition are not new. Even the sources of that fear and anxiety are not new. For the first century of its existence, America welcomed immigrants to help fill a vast continent. The first restrictions on immigration came in 1882 when the Congress enacted a law whose title was blunt, the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was a reaction to the entry of Chinese workers who helped build the railroad across the country. Until it was repealed over a half century later, it prohibited anyone of Chinese heritage from immigrating to the United States. In 1906, a major earthquake devastated San Francisco. Many public buildings were destroyed. Unable to accommodate all of the children whose schools were destroyed, the city adopted an audience to shrink the size of the student population by prohibiting any child of Japanese ancestry, even those born in the United States, from entering the public schools of that city. Even earlier, from the very beginning, when Spanish, Dutch, English, and French settlers fought one another, and the Native Americans for control of North America, a struggle that lasted for nearly 200 years. There was discrimination and opposition to those who were different. Everyone has heard the words Wall Street. Where did that phrase originate? Well, it's a small street at the southern tip of Manhattan that in the early 17th century marked the northern boundary of the Dutch settlement they called New Amsterdam. There, on Wall Street, the Dutch 
built a wall to keep out the people they feared. Not Native Americans, as most assumed, but the English, who had settled in what we now call New England, and who then spread south, threatening the Dutch. Later, successive waves of Italians and Irish, Jews and Catholics, and many others were met with hostility, exclusion, racial and religious stereotyping, and overt discrimination. Every Irish American is aware of the signs that appeared across New York and other American cities. Irish need not apply. And the cartoons that were published in newspapers and magazines depicting the Irish as subhuman. Now, of course, every rational American knows that we can no longer accept everyone who wants to live in our country. Common sense, national survival make clear. In our national interest, we need policies that place realistic limits on how many can enter and who they are. But our recent national debate has been completely negative, focused almost entirely on who cannot enter and why. Much of the recent controversy is over whether a religious test can be applied or is even constitutional. I believe we also should focus on who we want to enter and how we can continue to replenish our society with new people to their benefit and ours. From the very beginning to this very moment, America has been enriched by new people, new ideas, new energy, new vision. The three most valuable and successful business enterprises in America and arguably in the world are Apple, Amazon, and Google. Apple was created by Steve Jobs, whose father was born in Syria. Amazon was created by Jeff Bezos, whose adoptive father was born in Cuba. And the co-founder of Google was Sergey Brin, who himself was born in Russia. I ask every American here to think about two rhetorical questions. Would the United States be a better country today if they had not been admitted? And second, of equal importance, what do you think the chances are that Steve Jobs would have created Apple if he had been raised and lived in Syria? Or that Jeff Bezos would have created Amazon in Havana? Or that Sergey Brin would have created Google in Russia? Genius knows no language, no race, no religion. It can be found everywhere that there are human beings, but it is more likely to flourish where there is freedom, where there is education, where there is opportunity for all, where innovation is encouraged and success is celebrated and applauded. And that's surely the case now. The site, just a few examples, despite all of the negative talk about American decline. Nine of the 10 most valuable business brands in the world are American, as are 15 of the world's top 20 universities. Although Americans comprise only 6% of the world's population, American fund managers handle 55% of the world's assets. 91% of online searches in the world are done through American companies, and 99% of smartphones are on American-made operating systems. I could go on all day with similar statistics. The reality that our strength lies ultimately in our ideals is a major contributor to our success. Military power and economic strength are important, 
even necessary. But in the United States, they have been infused with the ideals that are the basis and the promise of American life. They're not easily summarized, but surely they include the sovereignty of the people. Individual liberty, our highest value. Opportunity for all. An independent judicial system and the rule of law applied equally to all and crucially to the government itself. Our Constitution is more than just a compilation of laws and procedures. It is a work of political and literary genius. It also is a statement of our ideals and a symbol of American values, especially the values of equal justice and equal rights for all. Despite all of the negative talk and the drumbeat of tragedy that dominates the news, I believe deeply in the promise and the future of America. We have much to be concerned about, but we have much more to be thankful for. And I'm convinced that in the 21st century, our country will, in almost every way, be stronger and better than ever. I pray that we will have the wisdom to use that strength for the positive goals of extending education, opportunity, and hope to more and more people in our country and all around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.